I think if dragons were real, our lives would be very different. They'd be circling around high in the sky and we'd be scuttling around down here on the ground. One morning after breakfast, I'd be going to get into my car to go to work. Then all of a sudden, without warning, a dragon would dive down out of the sky at 250 miles per hour with claws outstretched and wham! I'd be dragon food. That would be terrifying. We'd all start wearing gray coats to blend in with the pavement, and maybe people with naturally gray or, or silver hair would have a little bit of an advantage against a concrete backdrop. Or maybe we'd all just start wearing hats. Maybe we'd start becoming more nocturnal. This is the life that mice live, scuttling around from bush to bush, ever wary of shadows in the sky, hawks during the day, owls at night. In this video, we're going to explore the natural selection of mice with respect to their predators. We'll look at a couple of research projects that have tried to quantify how predation rates of mice change on light sandy beaches compared to dark soil substrates. I guess the first thing that I should mention is that lots of things eat mice, from foxes to raccoons to owls to hawks to snakes to feral cats and more. Most of these are sight and sound predators. Snakes use a combination of things including taste and smell, but by and large, mouse predators are sight and sound predators. When it comes to sight, it just means that if they see a mouse, they'll try to eat the mouse. So it seems obvious, if you're a mouse and you blend into your surroundings, you'll have an advantage. You'll live longer and likely reproduce more. One of the first studies to formally examine this with respect to Paramiscus polyanotis happened around 50 years ago. A young researcher by the name of Donald Kaufman was doing his PhD dissertation, and he decided to test the natural selection of Paramiscus polyanotis as it pertained to owls. He had two outdoor enclosures, one with light-colored soil and the other with dark-colored soil. What he then did was kind of simple. He released both a light brown mouse and a dark brown mouse into a given enclosure and then recorded which mouse got eaten first by the owl living in the enclosure. In enclosures with dark brown soil, the light brown mouse would get eaten first about 60% of the time. In enclosures with lighter brown soil, the dark brown mouse would get eaten first about 60% of the time. So there was a clear disadvantage if you didn't have adequate camouflage. The next study I'll talk about, and one of my favorites when it comes to natural selection and Paramiscus polyanotis, was done by Dr. Sasha Vigneri when she was a postdoctoral scholar at Harvard. She made clay models of mice. Uh, some were painted to look like they had dark fur, and some were painted to look like they had light fur. She then measured how frequently each color of mouse was attacked by mouse predators in different environments. But rather than me talking any more about it, I actually invited Dr. Vigneri to join us to tell us a little bit about her work. Thanks for stopping by today, Dr. Vigneri. You wrote a paper back in 2010 called The Selective Advantage of Crypsis in Mice, where you devised a really unique and creative way to explore crypsis, or camouflage, in Paramiscus polyanotis. This involved making little clay models of mice. Now, there had been some work on this topic prior to your study. What made your approach unique? What were you looking to accomplish? There's a lot of correlations between coat color and potential other things. You could have differences in behavior. You could even have differences in odor. There's things that certain mice might have that might be correlated with coat color that might suggest a pattern that is not actually real with coat color. We decided to test this in a very simple way by just looking directly at color and removing all other correlated traits and just testing the phenotype in these two different environments. So the light beach mice against the light sand and the dark old field mice against the dark sand. So from what I understand, you made hundreds of these little clay mice and you painted each one. Were you ever worried that this idea might not work? Yeah, the worry that it might not work was definitely present. Uh, but I will say my mom is an artist. And so 
when we started to think about, you know, how to do this, I think the fact that she actually came down to Florida and helped me paint all these models. And she took these tiny little brushes and painted the faces. And so, you know, in the end, these mice really looked like real mice. I think more so than, you know, somebody might think based on, you know, it's just a bunch of clay. So you put these clay mice out on sand beaches and at an inland wildlife management area. And I think you left them out for three days in each habitat. What did you discover at the end of three days? So we discovered pretty much what we expected, which is that, you know, cryptic mice were preyed upon at a much lower rate, about three times less than, than the, the mice that mismatched their background. And further, there was sort of a balancing selection effect. So we, we measured the reflectance of the models and the background that we put them on. And even in, let's say, one environment, mice that were both lighter and darker than their immediate background were selected against. So it wasn't just a light versus dark, it was actually gradients of light versus dark within each environment. So we clearly found that there was selection against mice that mismatched their background and further that it was a pretty fine level of selection. Well, thanks for popping in to give us this unique perspective on some of your prior work that really illustrates natural selection in action. Now, I know that work was many years ago. Where has your academic journey taken you since then? In the end, I ended up becoming an editor at Science. And I think the one thing I really like about this job is that I can have a, a big impact on science and, and conservation. I handle conservation papers um, much bigger than I would have on my own, you know, my own little research path. I really miss the research. Uh, I really miss being in the field, but being able to be in this position and really kind of convey the, the amazing research that everybody's doing to the scientific community is, has been a great opportunity. And so I'm now a deputy editor at Science and uh, that's where I am at the moment. Well, thank you once again for taking the time to share with us today. What a fantastic and creative way to explore natural selection. One thing you should know, Mice obviously don't choose their fur color. And unlike some mammals, like the snowshoe hare, mice don't change their fur color from one season to the next. Mouse A mates with mouse B, and they have a litter of mouse pups. Those mouse pups will have a variety of different shades of fur color, depending on the alleles that they received from their mouse parents. And if there was a mutation in something like the MC1R gene during meiosis, that would be when the mouse sperm or the mouse egg were formed, when that particular mouse sperm or egg are engaged ultimately in forming a particular mouse, that mouse might be an outlier in terms of fur color, an anomaly, a little bit different than expected compared to its mouse brothers and sisters in terms of fur color. Maybe it happens to be born with a fur color that almost exactly matches that of the beach, just by random chance, based on how effective the mutant MC1R protein that came from the mutant MC1R allele operates. In which case, that mouse would have a huge advantage over other mice in the population. It wouldn't be at high risk for predation. It would live longer and ultimately reproduce more than mice that aren't quite as neatly camouflaged. When this happens, the mutant allele that allowed the mouse to develop its excellent camouflage gets passed on at an abnormally high rate to the next generation of mice. That particular allele therefore starts to spread through the population like wildfire until over a few short generations, the mutant allele becomes the predominant allele within that population. Natural selection requires a mutation to occur that results in a new phenotype. A new phenotype like a new fur color. Then, depending on the habitat and the environmental conditions, if that new phenotype allows the individual to reproduce more than other individuals within the population, then that mutation is naturally selected for and the frequency of that allele increases over time. It's really that simple. To learn more about mouse natural selection or population genetics, be sure to check out the mouse fur color evolution case on our EvoEd website, or you can follow the links down below in the description. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.